Jess, did you let that contortionist back in? What? The guy in the corner hoarding the tikka with his toes? He said he was an Israel expert. Yes, well, he also sprinted out on the bill yesterday. Hmm. In retrospective, I thought his story sounded a bit suspicious. He sure didn't win any points with me. Check out my code. When I run it, it prints out this message. Okay. Huh. It says this season of the Bug Hunters Cafe is made possible by South Terrific, Mouse Paw Media, and many publications. How'd you get it to say that? I have no idea. Hi, Jason. Whoa. What's with that uh, Lego robot? Jess and the new manager, Annie, are trying out this idea to get more done. The robot can deliver coffee to the tables for them. Wow, interesting. But I feel like uh, this is getting into the automation efficiency paradox. They'll have to put a lot more time into making it work. Well, they have help. Felian Armand is back in the Lego room working on prototypes. This is the third iteration. <gasps> Two questions. First, can we have Felian uh, out here to chat? I've been reading her new book, Programmer's Brain, and I seriously want to talk to her. Yeah, I don't see why not. Cool. Second, and more importantly, how is it that we have a Lego room in the cafe but no one told me? Of course we have a Lego room. It's right down the hall across from the ice cream room. We have an ice cream room? I think I better go get Felian. Uh, you don't have to do that. Uh, she's right here. Hello, Felian. Hi. I'm excited to meet you. I had no idea you were in a cafe today. Apparently, there are lots of things people here have been forgetting to tell me. And the next thing you're going to tell me, you don't know about the Europop dance hall next to the break room. See? Here we have a break room and no one told me. <laughs> Sorry, I'll get you a map. <laughs> Hi, Felian. Have a seat. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, guys. <laughs> Hello and welcome. Can I get you anything to drink? Uh, the coffee's on Soft Terrific and Mouse Paw Media. They're the ones who are sponsoring the talks this year. Well, maybe the robots can bring me some coffee. Sure. What would you like? A cappuccino. All right. I'll see if the robot can... Do, oh, that... Uh, can the robot take orders? I haven't heard yet. No, I think right. this will be the next prototype. Uh, okay. I'll just... I'll, I'll go up and let them know what you want. Do you want the usual, Boyan? Yes. Decaffeinated espresso with a touch of a rainbow. We'll do, and I'll get you a map too of the cafe. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, welcome. It's a real pleasure to have you here. I have a bunch of questions, lots of regarding your book, but uh, also lots of regarding your experience as marathon runner. And somebody who has uh, run uh, 100 kilometers. Never. Uh, I have questions. How do you prepare for a marathon? Because to me, it's very similar to programming. So th there are many different ways, actually, that you can prepare for a marathon. So the first time I did a marathon, I really used like a classical training plan. Um, and that would involve slowly going first 20, 25, and then 30, and then 32 kilometers, sort of every other weekend. And you really build it up until you can do long distances and that's a way that some people train there are other ways as well so some people also use a heart rate based training schedule where you do less of these long distance trainings but you base yourself more on your heart rate so you calculate your perfect marathon heart rate and then you train a lot on this specific heart rate and i think that's interesting because there are different things you need to have right you need to have strong muscles you need to have a good heart rate mentally also you need to be prepared for doing the same thing for four hours which is kind of boring so i think it's interesting that those different training plans they all emphasize different parts of the experience and the more marathons you ran the more you can mix and match and, and you know how to prepare. So, so now I don't follow like one specific scheme. I sort of mix and match from things that I know add value for me. But I wouldn't recommend that for a beginner. I would really say for a beginner, pick any style of plan and follow it and see if it works. And then you can iterate in your 
subsequent marathons. Here's your coffee, um, Kalyan, and here's Thanks. your Foyan. And if I'm training for a marathon, I have to have something to run from. <laughs> like a tiger. Yeah, yeah, that would help a lot. So if I'm running, you should be running too, just as a rule. <laughs> Well, you mentioned marathons, and I noticed a very uh, nice uh, similarity between how you talk about programming. You said uh, that multitasking, trying uh, to learn with using several different methods at the same time does not work when you are starting. And you mentioned the same thing in your book. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, for sure. So many people, if they want to learn a new programming language. I imagine we're talking about people that already know one programming language and then they're learning the next programming language. Often they very much focus on programming, right? Things that people will say to each other are like, oh, you know, you want to learn, I know, Rust. You want to learn Rust? Uh, Why don't you just build something with Rust? Like a small to-do app or an app that can keep track of your marathon training times or something. This is the culture of learning to program is very often like, why don't you go build something? But then you are multitasking in a sense because you're learning a new language and also maybe you're solving a problem you haven't solved before in a slightly different way because this programming language will probably require you to do things in a different way than you're used to. Potentially, you're also learning a new IDE, like new tools to use, maybe a new build tool or a new unit testing framework because languages don't all use the same IDEs, although, you know, you have Visual Studio Code that can do many languages. So then you are learning many things at the same time. A new language, a new framework, maybe a new problem. And that's just very expensive for your brain to context switch between all those different types of learning. It might feel very effective because, oh, you know, you're building things. It it feels fun and enjoyable. But from a learning perspective, it's not so efficient. It is a lot efficient to say, okay, now I'm just really going to focus on the syntax of Rust. And for example, and I will pick something I have already programmed before in JavaScript. And then just sort of line by line, I will convert this code into Rust so that I can fully focus on the differences in syntax and also a little bit of concepts. But then I'm not also thinking about the problem. And maybe I do this in the same IDE so that that doesn't add extra cognitive load. So we will talk about maybe more like extra weight on my brain to do many things at the same time. Hmm. It's quite interesting. So trying to build a new project in a new language, in a new environment is like running with weights. Completely needless. Yes. If you don't have a stamina at all. Exactly, exactly. Oh, and part of me feels a little bad and I have to I have to put an asterisk on that feeling bad part because I'm not sure there's a way around it in my case. So one of the things I do is I run I run an internship program. And so I'll be taking programmers who already know a language, like they've already had some some training in some fashion or another. And the point of the internship is really to develop those soft skills. And I will say that, you know, I was, I was watching the talk you gave last year, by the way, on um, how we learn languages versus how you learn you know, human spoken language, like how we learn programming versus spoken language, uh, which I thought was really insightful. And I'm looking to integrate some of that. But one of the difficulties with the internship is that because of the duration and because of the fact that we're building things, but also sometimes because companies, unfortunately, will have the annoying expectation of like, okay, here's your new language, here's your new toolkit, have fun, now here's your ticket, build it. Then unfortunately, you can't fully get away from that, but which is the reason why I, I couldn't, I could never get away from this fully. But one of the things I try to do with interns when they're coming in and they're brand new to like C++ is... In most cases, when there's a code review available, I will have them do a code review and I'll just tell them, take your time, pull down the code. You don't have to worry about writing code. You don't have to worry about the IDE right now. Read the code, make notes on what isn't making sense to you. Just look at the changes, understand the change, just the changes in their context completely. And that is read the change. If something doesn't make sense, what is this piece of syntax? What is this doing? If it's not clear, we comment a lot. I tell them, comment the code a lot. Describe your intention a lot. So it really gives a good opportunity for the interns to go, well, what is this doing? And then to start unpacking some of those new syntactical elements. So even if they don't know the whole language in one shot, they've read some real code. And I notice that when they start programming, they have a lot easier time. Um, Where I feel bad. So right now I've got two interns onboarding and we don't have any code reviews open for them because we're at the start of a sprint. And so they're having to start by reading some existing code and figure out how to 
re-implement it in the new version. And I'm like, I hate throwing them that far in the deep end, but I'm not sure I have a way around it. There is one very, very good sentence in your book, among many. It's, uh, we spend most of the time reading code, but we spend almost none of the time practicing how to read code. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, absolutely. So, Jason, I really like your approach with onboarding people by reading code. This is one of the things, actually, I say in my book, that if you are onboarding people, it's not really a good strategy to to throw them in at the deep end and say, oh, why don't you just add a feature or fix a bug? It can be a really good strategy to read code because that very much also is a, a lower scale because you just have to do one thing at once, right? Because if you're reading code, you're also writing code if you have to implement a feature. Whereas if you're just reading code for code review purposes, you're just reading. So that can be less intense. And you're right. Research shows that professional programmers spend about 60% of their time reading code. That is a big percentage of time. And that's really different activities, right? So code review is reading code. Solving a bug probably also has to do with code because then you're reading code and maybe you're also reading documentation or comments or you're reading a ticket. But also part of that is reading code to figure out why isn't this code doing what it should do refactoring is reading code if you're improving the quality of your existing code base you're also reading and making decisions on how to improve and then implementing but all of that has reading but many many people only practice writing code like and this is true in universities if you did a cs undergrad but also if you go to a boot camp or if you learn in some sort of practical internship we almost always think that if you want to get better at programming you have to do more programming really sitting down and reading code is not an activity we deliberately practice. And that leads to all sorts of issues. But specifically, one of the issues is that people think reading code is really hard. And it is hard, but it's harder than it needs to be because we never practice. Like this is a bit <laughs> like running a marathon. Like is running a marathon hard? Well, it depends, right? It doesn't have to be hard if you train for it. It can be quite pleasant actually. But if you never train, it's gonna be hard for sure. I think that's the, the code reading situation we're also in. Yes, it can be hard to read code, but if you never practice, it's harder than it needs to be. Hmm. It reminds me of, there was a quote, and I wish I could just grab the book off the shelf and then I look it up, but um, no, Dreaming in Code by Scott Rosenberg, which is, uh, people know, I, I quote that one a lot because I love that book, but he quoted, um, he quoted one of the original developers of Sun Microsystems. I want to say Gabriel was the last name, but I can't remember off the top of my head this morning. Anyway, but he had said that, you know, I'm just paraphrasing, but a poet, you know, someone who's studying for a degree in poetry reads poetry. Someone who's studying for a degree in literature reads literature, but we don't read the literature of our discipline. We don't read great code. We don't have courses in literature of software engineering. And I, you know, if I had gone a different way and been able to teach a university, I don't have a degree. I'm never going to teach in a university. But if I had been able to teach in a university, I would have wanted to develop a course called Literature of Programming and literally spend the entire course just tell them, just stand up and go, in this course, we're not going to write a single line of code. We're going to be reading some of the greatest programs ever written. We're going to be reading parts of the Linux kernel. We're going to be reading parts of the COBOL compiler. We're going to be reading these great pieces of programming literature and studying how this was implemented. And I feel like that would be an amazing contribution to the to the learning process if I could talk at a university into it. Yes, yeah, so luckily there are some people who have sim- had similar ideas. It's a really nice book that I like. It's called Code Reading the Open Source Perspective by Diomedes Spinellis. And he sort of is he is a professor. And he sort of does that course in a book where he does show you pieces of open source code and then he describes like he tells you what to look for, right? Because just like, I don't know, reading Shakespeare or reading the Bible, it's sort of hard to do by yourself because there's maybe so much hidden meaning that you don't get. Of course, you can read it and you can enjoy it. But if you want to learn from it, then an experienced reader m- might really help you. So this book is really nice because that does this. It gives you code snippets. If you want to, you can read them alone. But then he also says, well, look at this part. And this is an interesting decision. And maybe what do you think about this? Would you do it the same? So that is, is, is maybe sort of all of what you're looking for. It is really interesting. Although there are also, of course, differences that if you read works of literature, often they can also be translated in your own language so that it's easier to read. 
maybe there should then be a Python version of the Linux kernel or something, right? So that Python people can at least see some of the of the logic of the algorithms in a language that's not super weird to them. Because again, otherwise you have this, this very high cognitive burden. If it's an algorithm or a strategy that's new for you and it's in a programming language that's new for you, it just isn't so accessible. Yeah. Or, or maybe another approach to it would be to have literature courses based on the literature of the language you're working in. Because, yeah. you know, Python is not well suited to kernel development. Uh, neither is C particularly well suited to GUI development. <laughs> yeah. But then also the interesting question, of course, is like, what is, the, what is the goal of such a course, right? Because there can be different goals. Like one goal, I think, like like the Omidas' book, uh, it's very much the, like the goal is to to learn from the code, to use code reading as a way to learn what is a good way to write code also. But the, another goal of such a course, and this is maybe more what my book is about, is it can also teach you what are strategies for reading code, right? And reading literature or reading the big, um, the Linux kernel or something, it isn't necessarily going to teach you how to read code. It might teach you what great code looks like. But such a course, I think, should also maybe have a part, which my book talks about a bit, that, okay, so now here's a here's code, and you don't know what it does. You don't even know, like, where it's from, maybe. <laughs> now, like, what is the strategy? That What are strategies that you can apply? And that's what my book covers. If you have unfamiliar code. Now what? whether you want to learn from it or whether you want to decide, is this efficient? Do I want to use this? Like, regardless of the goal, there are different strategies you can apply. Which is actually not that different from reading great literature anyway, because the difference oftentimes between a great teacher for Shakespeare, you know, we're going to study Shakespeare in this course, you know, the difference between a great professor or a great teacher for Shakespeare versus a lousy one is that the lousy one is going to be, okay, read Shakespeare, and then we're going to discuss next week. And the great one's like, now, here's how you read Shakespeare. Here's what this word meant. What do you think he means by this picture? Let's break down how he structured this piece of dialogue. And so they teach you literary analysis versus just passive intake. And I, I, I'm i going to guess that's what you're kind of saying with, with code is yeah, absolutely. code analysis as opposed to passive intake. Yes. Yeah. And I'm probably also, I guess, if we're in a language course, like, Shakespeare is the first thing we read, right? First we read like image books and then you read like children's books with very short sentences and then it gets more complicated and only at that level you're going to Shakespeare. We don't do Shakespeare with six-year-olds. That's just not fun for anyone, right? So you also need this gradual trajectory and then even for CS students in university, like something like the Linux kernel or the COBOL compiler, like let, let them do a 10 line method and do practice a little bit on that because because we don't practice this is already very very hard and can be super scary even for professional programmers if it's in a language or a framework that they don't know very often of course professionals look at code for like two seconds and they're like this seems complicated i can more easily do this myself like it's cheaper for my time if i just re-implement that because i really don't feel like understanding this that's because we don't practice so then I have to ask, do you think then some of the code review snobbery that we have, where we read a piece of code and go, this is garbage, I should uh, fix this, mm -hmm. is some of that perhaps related to the fact that we're not reading for appreciation? Because, you know, it, it's, it sounds like if we're going to continue with the, the, the analogy to literature, if you don't read with appreciation, it's very easy to look at Shakespeare or to look at Hemingway and go, this is garbage. But when you, you know, you have to apply strategies to really appreciate what the author is doing. Is that kind of a similar, is that where that snobbery comes from? Yeah. So, I mean, there, there's many parts to that, that snobbery there. So I think a few things that definitely come to mind. So it's very much easier to look at small things than it is at large things, right? So people will complain about, oh, there's a space before your opening bracket. Well, there shouldn't be a space before an opening bracket. That's, that's wicked. But still, that's very easy to complain about. Or, oh, that variable name, well, I don't think it's really properly, it should be creation instead of creating or something like that, right? So so looking at this, these very, very little things, in my native yes. language, we say putting salt on all the snails. This is the impression, expression we use for that. So if you're putting salt on all the little snails, it takes forever. Um, and it's not really what's, what's going on. So I do think that uh, some of that is just because that's the easy thing 
not only is it the easy thing, it's like the only thing they know, right? It's the only thing that I can do is complain about variable name or complain about indentation somewhere because I have not had so much practice in looking at the bigger picture. So I'm, I'm at a different level. And one other thing I think, I just lectured this morning to students and we were talking about this. Um, what I also think is we never talk about personal taste and how it's okay to have personal taste in programming. Right, because we're all so much like engineering, and there has to be logic. So if I don't like something, what I need culturally in our programming culture, I need to have arguments that make sense. Right, I have to say this method is too long because Fowler says ten lines is too long, or because Hermann says that this is too much cognitive load. But many of code reading is also just it is a matter of taste. And it's okay if different people have different tastes. I mean, I'm allowed to not like an orange, right? I'm allowed to have a taste in food. I'm allowed to have a taste in colors. Like I hate brown. I don't think brown is a very nice color. But then why am I allowed to have a taste in programming, right? This is not something we give each other space for. Where we say, well, I just don't like this. And I don't have an argument with it. Just it's not pretty, right? That is just not a thing. We are used to accepting. So sometimes I look at a piece of code, like a pull request comes into my open source project, and I look at it, and I'm like, eh, eh, it gives me an itch on my back. <laughs> I don't know why. Like we're just not used to having that conversation. So I think that's many, many parts, different parts of why code reviews are really hard, because we're not used to looking at the big picture. It's harder. We haven't practiced. And we're not used to just saying, I don't like the look of this. And this is what I would like better without math or anything. Or proof. Yeah. Well, and it's it's interesting. I'm in edits with a book right now, and my editor and I kind of came to odds about approach and an approach in a chapter. It's like, well, you know, I think it should be like this again. And and there's all these objective, you know, finger quotes, objective <laughs> reasons why my approach is so wrong. And and the publisher wants to take a look at it. He goes. Yeah, your approach is different. It's not wrong. It's different than the other books, but it's 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 you. It's your approach. There's actually yeah. nothing wrong with this technique. And you know, communicating that communicating that to the other, it's like you know what? This is a personal taste thing. Leave it alone. It's it, 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 even in literature, even in editing, that, that's hard. Leaving room, and I try to leave room for you know, like with my interns when I'm talking with other people in conversations. I try I try to leave room. For a personal opinion, people are like, well, I like JavaScript and I like indented with tabs. It's like, okay, great, have fun, <laughs> enjoy yourself. Uh, there's, see, there's, Lauren there's, is like, oh no. <laughs> hey, as as long as you like them, we're good. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I have three siblings. <laughs> All of them are front end developers, and I often ask myself what they do wrong. <laughs> I fail them as the older uh, sibling. <laughs> <laughs> but then of course the interesting the interesting difference if you're writing a book I'm assuming you're the sole author then that's fine and you're just making an agreement with your editor but but of course it can be tricky if different people have different tastes and they work together in one code base well at very least you have yeah. to you have to understand what other people's tastes is but also then a third person comes in and part of it is this style and part of it is that style and then then this isn't very welcoming or very easy then to get into um, so it is a concrete problem if two different people have different styles if they are contributing to the same code base you don't want the one person to change the indentation and then the next person comes in and sends a pull request with some changes and also has changed all indentation back to their style conflicting expectations and then the yeah. open source contributor runs yes yeah uh, for me uh, I love using uh, black that is uh, basically a styling tool for Python that way we don't have to talk about styling on pull requests, but actually focus on the logic. Yeah. And I also have a really good uh, hidden secret. The smaller the code, the more comments you're going to get. <laughs> if you write a function that's five lines code, you're going to get 20 suggestions or something less. If you submit a huge pull request, you're going to get one comment that says, Looks good. good. Yeah. Good. <laughs> yeah, this is very which is Which is the programmer's version of too long, didn't read. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm pitching that back to my interns all the time. They're like, they do it looks good to me. I'm like, try that again. <laughs> read it again. You didn't read it. <laughs> I'm having second thoughts about this robot, Jess. Yeah? What's wrong with it? 
Nothing really, except Marvin Minsky and Irving John Good keep trying to hack it so they can make it do the jitterbug. Mr. Minsky, please stop messing with the robot. By the way, what's the special today? Pistachio latte. Also, guests can get 35% off any order from Manning Publications at manning.com with the coupon code podbughunt21. I'm going to use it to get a programmer's brain by Felina at a month. It might help me understand what's wrong with these people. Mr. Minsky, a word, please. So, I have a question. I know how to find the great books. I'm going to just type it in Google. It's going to show me all the stuff. But how do I find good code? So initially, also when I started to do code reading clubs that I talk about in the book as well, it's just a group of people get together and they read code together. I was also like, oh, but what what code should we pick? So, you know, I was like scouring GitHub. I'm like, no, this is too long and this is too complex and this is too weird and this is too easy. Ultimately, very interesting. We found that it really, really, really doesn't matter. The basic premise that we have with code reading clubs, it should be about 100 lines because that's what you can do in the span of an hour, an hour and a half with with a dozen of people. That's sort of the maximum. Longer is not going to be productive for that setting. So you can really just take whatever you like, right? Your favorite database, your favorite library, your own open source project, just something random on GitHub. They're really nice ways that you can find GitHub projects. For example, you have this nice little website called good open issues. I really like that. If you're an open source maintainer like me, you can tag your issues with good open, a uh, good first issue. And then it will call all of that. And then people can search for good first issues. Typically, repositories that have good first issues, they're sort of welcoming and well-documented. They know what they're doing. So that is a really good way to find repos. And then you just pick a random one. Also, it doesn't matter at all whether this is a programming language that you already know or it's a programming language you've never seen before. We've done code reading clubs where even the facilitators didn't know what the programming language was. And still that's fine. Like you can still practice. So I totally understand your question now because I was struggling with the same, but we've been doing code uh, reading clubs now for two years and we found it really doesn't matter where you start, especially if you're a code reading beginner. If you're still getting used to the techniques that I describe in the book, then it doesn't matter with what you pick because any any piece of code is good to practice the, the first skills on. I want to start one of these now. <laughs> yeah. How do you start a code reading uh, club? You should start one. So we have all sorts of resources on codereadingclub.org where you can go. This is all free and open source. Um, we have resources there that, say, that says, this is a code snippet you can use. You can do whatever, but here's one that we tried. And here are some questions. This is like the agenda for your first club. You can just take them and start. What some people like to do is before they start their own club, they attend an open club. Every first Tuesday of the month, we have an open code reading club where anyone can join online. And it's in in the European evening, so it will be morning if you're in the US. And you can just join and sit in on one club, or you can go two or three times to this monthly open code reading club. And then you're like, oh, okay, now I know what I'm doing. And then you can spin off your own club. We do like advise that you attend the club just because it's fun and you, you get the hang of it. But you can totally just get a group of people together, either physically or remote, from your own organization. We've seen companies do it within their organization, but it can be also an open source repository. It can also be your local meetup group. Doesn't really matter. We say, well, between six and 12 people is like the ideal size, not too big, not too small. And you can just get started. That sounds phenomenal. Oh, yeah, we should do that. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Let me know if you do. Absolutely. You do, do, do like a Bug Hunters Cafe code reading club or something. Yeah. You totally I'll bring that. ice cream. You bring books. Uh, cool. <laughs> well, cool. Yeah, cool. Why, why, why? Well, I mean, the books are not a bad idea. So you, we know what to look. We can look up, you know. What is that syntax doing? But yeah, no. <laughs> we have Google. Mm-hmm. Look up on Google. Yeah, no, that that's it. You, one of the things you, you talked about in your... And, and the talk you gave last year um, that was in relation to this book, you talked a lot about teaching kids how to code. And I imagine that, that I mean, like you mentioned, 
that has a lot of advantages because we're a university student will not tell you. And I can attest to this. I get, I get interns where they will not tell you when they're confused. An eight-year-old will just go, this sucks. you got to love the brevity of an eight-year-old or seven or nine or what. They have no time for your bullshit. <laughs> oh, they're just, they're just, they're going to get right to it. I, I love it. But, um, you know, when, when you're teaching kids to code, do you notice any, any profound differences between teaching a kid to code versus teaching a, uh, you know, an adult, or is it just that the adults pretend to have it together, but really have many of the same learning needs? Yeah. So it is, it is the latter. So typically adults and beginners, so adult beginners or child beginners, all beginners sort of learn in the same way. Their brain is easily to get full if you give them too much information. Interesting differences are indeed that kids are a bit more open and they will just say, I'm confused. Not all kids, but more kids than adults typically will say, no, I don't get that. Whereas if you explain something very, if you explain like quantum mechanics to a, a room full of adults, you say, any questions? They all say, no, no, this was clear. This was fine. <laughs> so that is, that is definitely a difference. And another interesting difference is that we do find that people that are older, especially people that didn't grow up with programming, so they might be in their 30s and they don't have programming experience yet, that type of group might say, I can't learn this. This is too hard. I don't have the right brain. I don't have the right background. They just think that they will never learn because, well, maybe also people have told them very often that they are not smart enough or they're not good with computers. So sometimes these people have internalized the fact that programming is really hard, this can also be true, and it is also true for some younger kids, but this is also a bit more likely to occur in adults where they're like, well, this, it makes no, it, it's no use trying to learn this because it's so hard, I will never learn. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So how do you, when, when, you're, when you're teaching, how do you distinguish between, you know, a student who has the capacity, but doesn't have the information, doesn't have the right approach? versus um, there's a really good book called Trombone Player Wanted and it talks about how, you know, I could practice. He said, I hate the trombone. He said, I could practice, you know, 40 hours, 50, 60 hours a week, and I will be at best, if I work really, really hard, a mediocre trombone player. You know, like there are people who could, like they could learn coding in a sense of the term, but will never be good at it because it's just not their cup of tea. And they've got, you know, massive talent in other areas and coding just isn't that. Like they don't like mucking about with logic and numbers. So how do you how do you distinguish as a teacher between someone who just maybe just doesn't enjoy it because it's not like their brain is and the brain has other strengths and someone who does have that capacity but just is not understanding it because of the way you're presenting. It. Yeah, that's a great, great question. It's not not easy to answer. I would say it really depends on your goal as well. So if you're a middle school teacher and you want you want your students to know a bit of programming, then I don't think like it, this is not about becoming a professional programmer slash trombone player, right? This is just about having the basic literacy because th there's really a difference. I like this a trombone example. Like there's really a difference between trombone and reading, right? Unless you have severe mental issues. A teacher will never say, oh, reading, oh, the alphabet. Ah, that's not really your thing. Never mind, buddy. You have different strengths, right? Or the tables of multiplications. We're not going to say, well, you just don't know what five times four is. This is fine. You can draw really pretty, right? So there's some sort of basic level that we believe everyone can reach. And if you if you can't reach that, then this is really because you, you have a type of disability. I think... To a certain extent, this is also true for programming, that there's a certain level of programming everyone should be able to, to get to. And we shouldn't, I think we have this community for a long time said, oh, well, you, <laughs> brown people, black people, women, right? You're just all not really meant for programming. You don't have the right brain. Like people have sadly literally told me that because I'm a woman, I don't have the right brain to become a programmer. And this is people that people have said this to me, sadly. And I know other women, and I'm sure people of other, maybe with disabilities or people of color, have also had a certain experience. I've had it said to me, I'm a, I'm a brain injury survivor. And I, I actually yeah. sat in an interview and had one person said, well, you know, you never worked with a real team. I'm like, yeah. I've led a real team for 10 years, pal. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we should be really 
like careful with that because our community doesn't have the best track record in in really making this decision that some someone isn't right for programming. Although I mean, it's very true that some people like it more. Other some people are quicker to pick up certain programming skills. But I really think if the goal is this basic literacy that I care about in middle school students or also in university, I don't just teach computer science students, I also teach biology students or economics students or I work with a linguist that teaches programming to linguists. I don't accept, no, this is not for you in that crowd because I just want them to know a little, like a linguist should just be able to write a little Python program to do a little bit of natural language processing or how will they do their job in the future? And the same is true for an economist or for a biologist. So in, in that specific goal, I think, yeah, I am. I will never say this is not for you. Although, of course, that when you are really training professional programmers, then things are different. Then maybe it isn't like the right career or the most enjoyable career path. I would say to that that I, I have yet to ever identify an intern. I've been running this internship for about a, uh, almost a decade. And I've yet to identify an intern who was not cut out for programming on the basis of the technical skills. Yeah. I can usually spot it, and they can usually spot it, but usually I mean almost always, spot it themselves. But it's actually interestingly on the basis of the, of the non-technical components. We put so much emphasis on writing code, like you mentioned, but so much on writing code that we we underestimate not just reading code, but also things like, do you enjoy thinking about numeric computation? Like, do you enjoy taking these numbers and making them do things? Um, not necessarily any given one discipline, but like if you hate numbers with passion, you're probably not going to enjoy coding. You know, it's, you know, do you like communicating ideas with other people and then translating a human concept into computational logic and back again is that something you enjoy if not you're really going to hate this field it's like because there's all these things that aren't writing code to put so much more boot camps put such a premium on writing code and they have almost no emphasis on the numeracy on the communication and as you're bringing up on the on the code literacy that are arguably compose about 80 percent of the job yeah these are the things that kind of separate out the hobbyist i just i'm going to build something for fun you know on the weekend from the professional i'm going to do this 40 hours a week that's the difference in my in my experience yeah i know i think this is very true and it also depends a bit on uh, the culture of the team or the organization that you work in right so that you can also be a really good programmer but not just not really a, a good fit for a certain type of product or for a certain type of company like some people might be more uh, interested or better at working entirely remote in a remote team. And some people might need or want to work in a setting where you just see each other in the office. These are also different parts of programming or different parts of the programming career, right? That aren't the programming, uh, the writing code itself. Yeah, I know. I totally agree. And I, I think like I also have to, you know, talk about my own or academia's own lack. It's, I think it's not just boot camps. It's also university undergrad education in many places that also heavily emphasizes writing code. Like we don't have such a literacy course as you were describing. We don't have a course that is debugging. We don't have a course that is CI, CD, right? We deployment, bug tracking. Writing documentation. Writing documentation. All these things. We sort of say, well, we teach you programming and then you can you can learn the rest elsewhere, like in a company, like maybe by internships like yours, right? That's where you learn these things. We will we will not teach you, I don't know, debugging, IDE. And it's weird because it's actually the opposite. If you teach them all the other things, they can probably learn how to write code. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think there might be some truth in that indeed. It is, it is really weird. And it, but it's also so hard because oh yeah, my, I'm also always complaining that to my colleagues that like, they're doing like math or physics, that it is so unfair that in math, students come into the university and they know things, right? They've been counting their entire lives and high school algebra and high school calculus are really something, right? I know my math colleagues are like, well, they know nothing if they come from high school. Yeah, this is true, but they, they do know things, right? Yeah, Whereas easily. with computer science, where I am and, and where most people are, sadly, Computer science is not a course, a mandatory course in high school. In my country, only half of the high schools offers computer science as an elective, and the others don't. 
So in university, we really have to start at, at ground zero, right? Mm -hmm. We have to teach some of them, this is the file system. This is a variable. This is a database. This is a text file on your computer. So that you have to start at quite a low level. And then you just have three, in my situation, three years of undergrad. Mm. Fits nothing. And it's so hard to make these choices. My first day of university, our professor for computer science asked us uh, who here has done uh, programming. And a couple of people raised hands. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you are going to be at disadvantage as this course because you're going to have to forget all your learning. <laughs> yeah, that is true. Uh, because we were learning basic and Pascal in middle school. Mm -hmm. And we were not learning it on computers, computers, but computers that were using gramophone records. No. <laughs> the old stuff. <laughs> and when you program a computer that's older than you, there's a bit of a difference when you come to C++ and other languages that are normal. <laughs> normal. <laughs> Define normal. I mean, yeah, this is a good question. This or is C++ weird and the older languages are normal? <laughs> that would be really my depends question. on your perspective. Yeah. Also, one thing I wanted to ask about is uh, you talk a lot about uh, cognitive load and how to reduce it. Yeah. Share a couple of techniques for that. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe first the definition, like cognitive load, the easy term, like the easy definition of that term is if your brain is doing too many things at the same time. Like a concrete example is you're programming, right? And you're, you're, you're doing something complex and then someone comes in and says, hey, Bojan, do you want a coffee? And then, pff, right, this is the straw that breaks the camel back and then your entire mind is empty. So this is cognitive load or more specifically cognitive overload. Like you're doing so many things, more is not possible. If you try to do more, the whole house of cards sort of collapses. That's the easy way to think about it. And this is, of course, sadly common that we're doing something that is so complex that... It is too much. So there are many, many things you can do. And in the book, it describes many different scenarios in different contexts, like interruptions, or difficult algorithms. So I think that the most important thing is to be aware that this is a thing that exists and understand that that's what's happening. Because before I knew cognitive loads, I was always thinking I was not smart, right? I was doing programming and it's really hard and I didn't know what to do and I created a bug or I made a test fail and I didn't oversee the results. And it was like, well, maybe I'm just not smart enough to be a programmer. Or no, maybe this is too hard. Or when I was learning a new language, like I went from C Sharp to Python and then from Python to Rust. When I was first learning Rust, I was like, I, I'm too old. I'm at the end of my 30. I'm too old to learn a new language. I will never be able to do this. It is so hard. Rust is so weird compared to Python. Everything is different. So it made my life better when I was like, well, this is not because I'm not smart. This is actually because it's just my brain is doing too many things at the same time. Learning the syntax of Rust, learning concepts in Rust that are different or that don't exist even in Python. And also programming, right? This is too much. So that I think is the most important thing that you realize that your brain is quite limited actually. You cannot do many things and you can certainly not do many things at the same time. So if you have to do this, you have to break up the problem in pieces. So many things that you can do, like you can offload part of your the information that you're holding in your brain to paper or to the IDE. And for example, when you're interrupted, often when I have to stop programming because a meeting is starting, then I know the next day it's going to be really hard, lots of work for me to rebuild my mental model. So then in the codes, I immediately say, okay, this is your next steps are this and this and this, and this is why. It's just two lines of comments. Even if someone interrupts you, you can say, wait, 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 give me one second to dro drop my mental model in the code or on paper, it doesn't matter where you drop it, of course. And then the next day, it will be so much easier for you to go because you will know that rebuilding your mental model is an operation that can take lots and lots of cognitive load. Another situation, if you are, for example, you find yourself in a situation that you're reading the same piece of code three or four times, right? A, a, a code review, a pull request, someone submits something to you and you sort of understand what it does because you read the description. You look at this code one time and two times and three times and still it doesn't make sense to you, right? Then some people might 
then quit. And other people might think, well, I can read it four times or five times. Maybe next time it will make sense. I mean, depending on your personality, those are sort of the two, the two ways that you can go. But you could also say, well, wait, let, let me take a step back. I am noticing that this is it's too hard for my brain, right? Because if it wasn't, I would have understood it the first time. So if something is going on here. Maybe like what are parts I do recognize? So you can be explicit about trying to understand what are the parts I do recognize? Let's write down which parts I understand. And I put this on paper. Okay, this is, this is the part I already said. Now let's deliberately see what are the parts that are confusing to me? And this is one of the exercises we do in Code Club, right? Where we practice the skill of writing down meticulously. What do I understand? What do I not understand? Okay, here's a concept or a variable name, right? Here's a variable name. I don't really know what this variable represents. Okay, this is a clear task. So now my, my the big job of trying to figure out this, this piece of code that I don't understand, I've taken a more manageable piece. And now my next task is understand what this variable does, right? And then I can do another technique. I can do control F or grep or whatever in the source code and see, okay, where is this variable used? This way you can sort of build <laughs> Lego blocks. You can have Lego blocks of knowledge. And then with that, maybe you can make a tower of understanding. So it doesn't really make sense if there's many pieces in a certain code, like variable names, constructs, syntactic constructs, concepts that you don't know. It doesn't make sense to plow on if you don't know half of the things. Then you should really change your activity to first understand those basic blocks. And then with that understanding, come back and then you'll see that you will have lower cognitive load. Interesting. I've actually been doing part of that. I, I need to do more of the note taking, especially. But one of the things I do when I'm, because I work a lot with legacy code, modernizing legacy code. So I have to read probably more code than most developers will have to because I have to read some really old code and I have to figure out how to modernize it without breaking it. And um, one of the strategies I always have is that I will go through, I'll make a copy of the code and I will comment every logical block with the description of what is it doing and I will follow the execution flow but if I can't, well sometimes it will do top down sometimes it will do execution flow, it depends on the file but I will not move on until I can say this does this thing and sometimes it takes me 10 minutes and sometimes it takes me you know half an hour to figure out okay why are they using a void here what is this but once I understand what the programmer was thinking initially then I recreate their what I believe is their cognitive intent in the comment and then I move on and I find that really helps me because I don't have to memorize the code when I when I scroll back up to line 18 and I don't have to rebuild it. I said, oh, there's my note. Yeah, yeah, this is exactly what I describe. I think I think nothing that I describe in the book is really like something that no one has ever done. And many things are things that many people already do. It just gives this like this intuition you already had. It sort of backs it up with science that yeah, if you don't know what things mean, it's harder than if you have some understanding or good understanding what things mean. So this strategy that you're using, this is make, makes total sense. Sure. I have a bunch of questions. Go ahead. Uh, You've uh, been talking also about the limitation in the code. Uh, how many things we can keep in our head. And I was very surprised when I heard the numbers. Because I thought it was going to be 50, 40 things. <laughs> can you tell us more about that? Yes, absolutely. So you, the, the, the research you're referring to is called the magical number seven plus or minus two, which means that in your brain, you can hold like between five and nine elements at the same time. This is old research from like the 1950s. Newer research shows that it, the limit might be even lower, that you could probably only hold between four and six elements in your brain at the same time. And then you're like, wow, that's not a lot. How, how can we do anything? And this is because we can organize information in such a way that it makes sense. Like if I say information for you, that fills one element in your brain, that's one thing. Whereas for someone that's learning to read, information might be all those separate letters, right? The six-year-old will see the word information and will not be able to process, to chunk is what we call this, to chunk this as one. They will go like I-N-F-O-R-M. Right? So they will go letter by letter and then our brain gets really full. This is why younger kids start with shorter words so that their brains don't get too full too quickly. So we group information and then 
instead of the big blob of information picking all those different slots and then easily overloading the four to six, we group information and this way it only fills one slot. And this is, the, I explained that in, this in the book as well. Some really interesting research, like this is why design patterns work. This is why design patterns are helpful in understanding code because a beginner, like a six-year-old going letter by letter, one of your interns, or one of my undergrads, goes line by line through the code, right? They do not immediately grasp the whole block of code, but what they do is line by line. Whereas us, more, more experienced programmers, we look at code and we say, oh, this is a for loop, this is a while loop, this is a constructor, this is an initialization, and this is the singleton pattern, right? So we look at something and we immediately see the pattern. This is why it's easier to understand, to also to remember code for us, to process, to talk about it, because for us, maybe a constructor, it takes one slot because we look at something as like, oh, it's a constructor. Whereas a beginning Python programmer doesn't even see that it's a constructor or the word constructor isn't there. They're like, Dev underscore underscore in it underscore underscore. They're reading everything because they don't see the role of the thing immediately. Whereas we like, oh, you know, we're not going to read that. We know it's a constructor role. Well, it probably puts some values on fields on the class instance. This is not where the interesting part lies. Whereas for a beginner, they don't know where the interesting parts are. So they can be overloaded quite easily because every line, in, or in some cases on one line, they can be multiple concepts. Like, uh, int x is 5, right? This, this can be, depending on your level, different blocks of information. So yes, this 4 to 6 limit sounds tremendously small, um, but the way we humans overcome that is by filling the slots not with letters, but with words, and then in terms of programming, not by lines of code, but we think in a higher level of abstraction. Mm. Cognitive compression algorithms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a bit. And it's also interesting because they've done these really, really nice experiments where if you put a... I, I've done this experiment myself as well. If you put a very, very small error in a code block, like, for example, you do a you do a while loop and then instead of I++, plus plus, you do something really weird like I plus is I plus one, right? So it looks like I is I plus one, but it isn't because it's I becomes I plus is one. So you can do something really, hide something really weird and experts will notice. They will just look at the for loop or the while loop. They look at it and it's like, oh, this is a while loop over the, the array of customers. And they will not see these little details because it's just abstracted away for them. They don't even look. Whereas beginners are really good at spotting these type of errors because they're like, this is really weird. Let me read that again. And it doesn't, it doesn't even register for experts. This is why, you know, you way back you had these little puzzles on Facebook with words and then all the letters would be in a random order and you could still really, really easily read the words. That is exactly this principle where you look at the word, even though the letters are in a, in a weird order, you immediately recognize the word. If you give that to a six-year-old, they'll be like, this is magic. Right? How can you ever <laughs> read that? Their letters are not in the right. That is exactly the same thing with beginners in programming. Wow. So have your juniors do more code reviews. They'll find your errors. Yeah, they will definitely find different types of errors, right? <laughs> they will not find the weird caching, synchronization, optimization, multi-threaded stuff. That's unlikely to happen. So don't put all your eggs in like their basket. <laughs> but they are likely to find these little, little like syntactic um, slips that for you, you're just blind to them. Well, which, very which often the compiler is not blind to them. So that, that is nice. Yeah. But but uh, you know, often if those are in just the right place, they produce some of the hardest to debug things. Where you spend six weeks yep, on the same semicolon, which yep. which my mother then walks behind me and spots it. <laughs> yes. True yeah. story. Speaking of bugs, then what's your weirdest or one of the weirdest bugs you've encountered? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. So recently we had a weird. So just it's probably hard to like summarize quickly, but. We had a bug where a, a library was updated because in the requirements file, we just said, oh, it needs at least this version. And then this library was updated. But in itself, it's not, not really a problem. But I made auto changes. So I made auto changes. And then suddenly, half of my tests are failing. So I was like, how, you know, this, you don't know this feeling, right? How is this related to that? And I spent like three hours debugging this. Like, how is it possible? These things aren't even connected to each other. They, they were not. But in the meantime, also a library was updated that, that implemented some behavior in a slightly different way. So I think the, 
that that was a bug that really took me a while because I kept l- looking in the wrong place. I kept like, I'm, I talk about this in the book as well, like check your assumptions, right? What I could have done. And ultimately one of my coworkers was like, but how did this ever work, right? Let's run these tests on the current main locally and see if they pass. And then our main is always unit tested. So whatever is in main, all the tests have passed at one point or they would not be in there. So I just check out, I have three hours. I just check out main locally on my computer and it doesn't work. (laughs) So then it's like, okay, well, it was not the changes I introduced at all. It was something else. And then, then you get this like, then your hunt gets less weird because at least you know, okay, so what has changed in the meantime? What computer did we run the tests on and what was the status there? And then then we figured out it was a library. But it really took me a few hours because I kept looking in the wrong place and I kept telling myself, but this is not possible that this change causes this behavior. And it was indeed, that that was true, but I I should have let that go. Okay, so now you're sure that this is not connected? The the, the cause must be somewhere else. And it took me a really long time. And actually, it took me, someone else needed to tell me, like, (laughs) you are stuck, right? You are stuck in a hole. Stop digging. (laughs) Look out. (laughs) I I, I had a similar case where I was was getting ready to remove a line of code. I'm like, well, I think this is the error. I'm like getting ready to remove it. And I'm pair programming with one of my former interns. He's like, hold on. You wrote that line of code for a reason. What is that reason? (laughs) I'm going, I don't know. It just looks wrong. He said, well, um, before you remove it, you might want to figure out what it does. And sure enough, he was right. The the bug was elsewhere. That that, that line of code would have broken it in a really, if I had removed that, it would have broken things and it would have made it worse in a really, really subtle way. (laughs) I'm like, thank you. Because I make, you know. You know, we do that. We think, well, I'm, I'm a senior engineer. I'm a professor. I'm a, you know, I, I understand this. And we jump to these conclusions. Yes. Yeah, that is really nice. So I think this is in, in recent history, like this was an annoying bug that that really took me a while. For me, I have a similar problem at, when I'm doing uh, exercise in uh, dictation for French, because I think I heard a word and mm-hmm. I'm just going to write that. And I keep stubbornly clinging to that word. So my professor has to tell me a couple of times, forget what you think you heard, try again. And that's very, very hard for me because I'm stuck in my assumptions. Yes, yeah, th- that is really the hardest, I think, because you are stuck in your assumptions and your routines. And sometimes you... You think, oh, the solution is right there, and then it's somewhere else. And that mental shift, that really takes a while. Which I guess is going back again to why, you know, bring on juniors, why you need juniors on your team is because they don't have some of those assumptions. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's definitely a reason. Like, also because it's sort of, (laughs) it's our responsibility to make sure that young people can also make it into the field. I think that's a good reason also to have juniors, but it's very, very right that explaining like this one line of code that you talk about, right? Explaining to this person why that line is there then you're also talking to yourself because you almost forgot. And there are many parts of my code base that I don't remember why it's there. Sometimes I get blame and then it turns out to be me that put the line <laughs> there. I'm like, I don't, I have no knowledge of this. Like I, <laughs> I, I never had textual relationships with that line of code. I don't know. <laughs> but does that mean that a lot of engineering teams that are hiring just seniors right now, that they're just, they're, they're literally filtering their candidate base for just seniors, just seniors. They think they're working on something that's so, you know, arcane. Does that mean they're making a fundamental mistake in their strategy? Then? Yeah. So I don't know if I can generalize like that. There might be teams that are doing something that's so complex. I don't know. If you're sending the Mars rover to Mars, then maybe maybe you want to have seasoned engineers there because it's going to be very expensive to let that fail. So there might be contexts where it makes sense. But I do think at least you have to think about so Some people might think that, oh, seniors are more value, right? A senior engineer is three times maybe a junior engineer or something like this. I'm uh, engineer. But that, that might not always be true because the value that junior engineers bring might be really different. I, I, I'm quite confident, I don't have science to back this up, but I'm quite confident that if you bring a junior into your team, the, the quality of your code 
will increase and the quality of your documentation will increase because they keep asking you these annoying questions like why is the line of code there or are you sure we need this version of the library and it's like oh no i'm not sure let's write this down somewhere let's make a change oh you were right this method is very long well we all understand it because you know we all collaborated on it but now that you say it yes it is indeed very complex let's see if we can break this up so I think if you have a junior and you treat them well, right? <laughs> if you have a junior and it's not like, oh, here, here's he again with these questions. Let's all dive under our, all, uh, all, <laughs> our desks because we want to avoid them. Like, if you treat them well, then adding a junior to your team will, of course, I would almost say, improve the quality of, of the code, improve the quality of your thinking about it as well. And also there are not so many senior engineers. So many situations, many people might be forced, so to say, to hire uh, juniors because everyone wants to have the good seniors. They're all gone. They already have a job and they're making lots of money. So we can hire all of them. Mm. And of course, that could even apply to someone who maybe is experienced, but doesn't know this language or this platform or this yeah. tooling. And, and Yeah, I think many, many software companies or also non-software companies with a software component like, like banks and stuff, they are also forced to hire people that are not yet trained in the programming language or the framework or the library that they would like, right? They, they might say we need a, a Java programmer, but then the C programmer services that they can hire, it's like, yeah, okay, you know, you don't have the exact right background, but you are someone that is for hire and we need a programmer, so we'll teach you this language or this framework or this platform because we have to. There's just so big of a shortage that this is necessary for many companies. Yeah. Now, now, if the recruiters can just learn learn that and stop rolling people out because they don't have 10 years experience with Kubernetes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know what to do there. Maybe they should read my book. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. That that would, would just start handing out copies. Like, here you go. Mandatory reading. Please read it. <laughs> there will be a quiz. <laughs> yeah. I think this was super fun. It was. My cup, my cup is empty. I, I'm happy if you're happy. We talked about many fun things. Oh, uh, we did, and uh, yeah, I, I've gone through. I've gone through my whole cup of coffee, and I'm about ready to go get another. So uh, good. And uh, now I want to go play in that Lego room. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us here. Well, this thanks for having me. Flirt. It was really, really nice. If people want to, if people want to look you up, where should they, uh, you know, where should they go to? Twitter is definitely the best place. And my Twitter is really conveniently just my first name. I have a website as well. It is felina.com. So that's also easy. It's just my first name.com. But I'm, I don't blog so actively anymore since COVID. Uh, but so Twitter is definitely the, the right place. Excellent. And then, uh, of course, people should get your book. <laughs> yes, so that's also easy. Well, they can just go to the website as well, to Manning, of course, but Felina's and to Amazon and every, everyone sells it. But Felina's complex book is super easy. Well, thank you so much. This has been an absolute blast. Let's go check out that Lego room together. You said you're going to work on another prototype of that bot, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. So that it can take orders. Yeah, yeah. Let's, 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 maybe I can, maybe we can help with that. I, I'm, I'm itching to build something now. Yeah, let's do this together. You can review my Lego code. Oh, that works. <laughs> Re- practice the reading code. That works. Yeah, we can do it with Lego code. Why not? <laughs> Bog Hunters Cafe, this is Jess. We are, yes. In fact, we're open 24 7 at boghunters.cafe. You can also find us on Twitter as Bog Hunters Cafe. Our music is provided by audionautics.com. We have a link on our website. You should know that we're giving away a free copy of The Programmer's Brain by Felina Harmons. For your chance to win, just retweet our Twitter post about it and then follow Bug Hunters Cafe for the announcement of the winner in a few weeks. Yes, you're welcome. See you then. Huh. Where did they go? Annie, did you see where Marvin Minsky and Irving John Good went? They haven't paid up yet. They're back in the Lego room, building their own robot rather than messing with the hours. The Lego room? Isn't that going to expose them to technology beyond their time period? Don't worry, the portals have a causality filter. 
folks won't remember anything about the future when they go back through. Thank heavens for that. 